forward-looking studies paint a very grim picture. In 2018, we did have people transported to the hospital. With climate change, it's just going to get hotter and hotter, and especially more extreme heat. As the Gulf warms, we're going to see dire impacts. Certain places no longer be inhabitable. We've always had extreme weather. But over the last 20 years, as climate change has accelerated, it has mutated and become more dangerous and unpredictable. From dry lightning, to the polar vortex, to bomb cyclones, and the fire nado. Welcome to the new reality. Welcome to mutant weather. Our planet is heating up. As humans continue to burn fossil fuels for energy, greenhouse gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere increase. Global temperatures have warmed by one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial average and four degrees in the Arctic. The Earth feels that. Uh, even at one degree, which is about where we are now of warming on our climate system, we're seeing dramatic changes in the Earth system. The heat amassing in the Earth's atmosphere contributes to more intense hurricanes, watch out, watch out. massive wildfires, and glacial melting. The entire planet is destabilized by mutant heat. Climate change is, is altering the behavior of the atmosphere, and it's making it more likely that we have these extreme events. So the extremes in the weather that are going to continue to be realized going forward are going to be even more extreme than are occurring today. And people have to realize that an additional temperature on the planet of 0.5 degrees or one more degree beyond we where now, uh, uh, that is going to bring a catastrophe effectively to uh, planetary systems and, and weather. Over the last four decades, every decade has been warmer than the preceding decade. In an atmosphere that is a couple of degrees warmer than 150 years ago, it shifts the behavior of the atmosphere, it shifts the probability distributions, and it makes it much more likely that we get these really high temperatures. Mutant heat from climate change is the engine that powers extreme weather. And it has direct and deadly effects around the world including the United States. Heat kills more people than almost every other weather hazard combined. So for that reason alone, it, it deserves our attention. On our heating planet, agriculture is threatened by drought. Huge swaths of land are becoming uninhabitable, and the oceans are warming at such unprecedented rates, marine life is profoundly disrupted. The last five years in the oceans, each year has succeedingly been the hottest year ever recorded. It's accelerating so quickly. In the summer of 2018, mutant heat assaults the globe, smashing temperature records worldwide. The roof of the Glasgow Science Center in Scotland melts under the oppressive fever of the sun's rays. In California, the power grid buckles under the demand for cooling, leaving tens of thousands sweltering without air conditioning. And in Montreal, a scorching heat wave sends dozens to the morgue. July 1st, 2018. Montreal, Quebec is cleaning up from its biggest party of the year, Saint Jean Baptiste Day when a sweltering heat blankets the city. The weight really just slammed on us. You could feel the heat on your skin. You could feel the sun just pounding down on you. We had the warning in the, on the news and on the day it was supposed to start, <laughs> it started. Yeah, it was searing up. Montreal is a city known for its bone chilling winters. But this year, it's the stifling heat that's creating challenges for residents like 45-year-old Vincent Osru. People were tired, dead tired all the time. You could almost feel the humidity, uh, the weight of the air, and uh, walking through soup, uh, basically. Everybody is cranky. With humidity, temperatures soar to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, 25 degrees above seasonal average, a heat wave is declared. A heat wave has to be abnormally high temperatures and they have to have some persistence for at least a couple of days, um, up to a couple of weeks. So 
you know, ultimately, I think what constitutes a heat wave is, is when you have a health impact on the human population. I think it has to be something that has an impact. So when we have extreme heat waves now, it's likely uh, containing the DNA of climate change. So we are in new normals, and so people have to adjust their experience and, and perceptions accordingly. Vincent and his six children cope as best they can. The younger ones uh, mainly stayed indoors during that period of time. Our rooms at home are in the basement, and we were quite happy that they were in the basement. We used to have gatherings in my backyard on a regular basis. Uh, there were no gathering in the backyard during that week, and uh, the air conditioning at home was pumping full time. Research shows the recent spate of mutant heat waves is attributed to the rapidly warming Arctic and its impact on the polar jet stream. The weather patterns around the world are governed by this fast moving river of air in the upper levels called the jet stream. Uh, typically north of the jet stream, temperatures are cooler and south of the jet stream, they're warmer. And the dividing line or boundary of those different temperature air masses gives us weather. As we continue to see uh, extremely warm temperatures in the Arctic, uh, that accelerates the melting processes for sea ice. There's less of a difference between the Arctic temperatures and the tropical temperatures, and that affects the strength of the jet stream. Recent research finds the jet stream is at least 8% weaker than just 40 years ago. When jet stream patterns stall, the atmospheric conditions stay in one place longer. A string of sunny, warm days becomes hotter and hotter until the temperatures become unbearable. There is already evidence that the jet stream is becoming much wavier and loopier and stalling in place, and that leads to more extreme weather on the warm and cold side, on the dry and wet side. 2019, Europe. Mutant heat settles over the continent. It's a bit hot, like, in, in the shade it's bearable, but, like, when you're out in the direct sunlight, it's, it's, it's hot. It's a heat dome. A heat dome forms under strong areas of high pressure and high humidity. The high pressure acts like a cap preventing the humidity from escaping. It drops back down to the Earth's surface, elevating temperatures to sweltering levels. The weakened jet stream doesn't have the strength to penetrate it and push the heat along. Temperatures steadily increase, bringing blistering levels. Free. Because this was very hot to stay at home. This is just like too much, too much, especially in the public transportation. Even if we look at 2019, extreme heat waves in Paris, in Europe, United States, India, these heat waves are beyond the normal heat wave that people are experiencing, and they're likely linked to climate change. Heat waves have some of the strongest linkage to climate change of any extreme weather event. The, the scientific studies show that. Heat waves are a temporary hazard for most of the world, lasting just days or a few weeks. But in the American Southwest, muted heat is a permanent fact of life. And as this region sees temperatures continue to increase, it offers us a forewarning of our future in a hotter world. At the northern end of the Sonoran Desert sits America's fifth largest city. Here in Phoenix, we're in the hottest large metropolitan area in the United States. Every year we see more than 100 days with temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. And that's a number that we've seen increasing over the past few decades and expect to continue to see an uh, increase in the future. David Hondula is a scientist who researches how environmental heat affects human health. Deaths from heat exposure in Arizona have tripled in just three years, from 48 in 2014 to 132 in 2017. Forward-looking studies related to climate change and heat and impacts on public health paint a very grim picture for what might be coming. As early as 2030, we could see single summers with more than 10,000 heat-related deaths in our country. That's compared to a current rate of 700 per year. Montreal, Canada. At Montreal's Heart Institute Prevention Center, Dr. Daniel Gagnon researches the effects of heat waves on the human body. 
Okay, so just sit straight ahead on the chair. Perfect. We know that extreme heat is associated with increased risk of mortality and also an increased risk of ending up in a hospital. In his research lab, he simulates a range of conditions, from extremely dry heat like in Australia to a cooler but much more humid heat wave like the one that Montreal suffered in 2018. What we really want to discover is how the body responds and how it adapts to heat exposure. We have an internal body temperature of approximately 37 degrees Celsius, and our body actively fights to keep our temperature around that level because that's what's optimal for our best health. We can sustain or tolerate increases in our internal body temperature up to approximately 39 to 39.5 degrees Celsius. But if we go past 40 and especially past 41 degrees Celsius, then we talk more about a heat stroke and then we have impairments in central nervous system function, and it can lead to coma and death if it's not treated rapidly. The front lines of climate change are starkly visible, calving ice shelves in the Arctic and Antarctic, typhoon devastated towns in Japan, and flooded coastal communities like Venice. But sometimes these front lines are in more unexpected places. Stonington, Maine. On the tip of Deer Isle lies a small fishing town. I think community is what makes this place the most unique. It's like a great family where you can fight with your brother, but then if anybody else comes in and talks about your brother, you're gonna defend your brother to the, to the end. It feels like, you know, 50 years ago where Somebody gets hurt and they still have a bean supper and like nobody ever goes without and people take care of each other. You know, everyone really knows each other. Stonington relies heavily on the surrounding ocean for its survival. We have a year-round residence on Deer Isle of about 1,500 people and just about everyone is connected to lobstering in one way or another. We have roughly 350 boats fishing here and we land roughly $32 million worth of lobster a year. The working waterfront, the lobster industry is very much part of our heritage and our cultural identity. It is our sense of place and really informs the way that we live our lives in this community. Genevieve McDonald, a lobster boat captain, has been fishing for 14 years. So I have a kind of a unique position in the lobster industry where I'm a mom, I have young kids, I have 18 month old twin daughters, and so my day doesn't start until I drop them off at daycare. My stern man is another mom, she's my sister-in-law. I love the people in the industry, I love the camaraderie, I love the independence, and I get to see every day all these fascinating things that come up in traps. Previously, the cold waters of the Gulf of Maine were not ideal for lobster fishing. But since the early 1980s, the warming global waters gave struggling towns along the coast an economic lifeline that turned into a boom. As water temperatures in the Gulf of Maine began to increase, we saw this explosion of the resource. Pound per pot is how we measure landings for ourselves, you know, how many lobsters per trap, and that just it literally exploded from one season to the next. We had a limited sweet spot um, where lobsters were surviving in the cooler ranges of their tolerance. And then the water warmed and we were able to expand, take advantage of um, the warmer waters by growing faster, reaching reproductive age and size faster. We've basically increased our sweet spot. In 2012, temperatures in the Gulf spiked to 69 degrees Fahrenheit an all-time high, making the waters a paradise for lobsters. That year, Stonington hauled in the highest lobster landing it had ever seen. It was phenomenal. I mean, it was really kind of a gold rush for the lobster industry. But since then, the ocean waters around Stonington continue to warm, and now they're warming to levels that are too hot for the lobsters. Once they reach a certain persistent warm temperatures, greater than 60 some odd degrees Fahrenheit, they run into low oxygen environments. Low oxygen then weakens their, their immunity and they also can become subject to things like shell disease. 
The crustaceans are migrating northward to Canada in search of cooler waters, leaving an uncertain economic future for lobster fisheries in Maine. Scientists are observing that oceans are heating at an alarming rate, 40% faster than predicted by climate models just a few years ago. The oceans have absorbed over 90% of all the heat that we've added to the atmosphere and half of that since just 1997. And that's enough heat that if they hadn't absorbed all that heat, our atmosphere today would be 97 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than it is right now, which is an astounding amount of heat and energy. All that heat is suffocating our oceans. The warmer the water becomes, the less dissolved oxygen it contains, and marine life needs oxygen to survive. This excessive warming is leading to the expansion of dead zones, areas where so little oxygen exists, it makes life for ocean species nearly impossible to sustain. The ocean is like a density layer cake. And so as it absorbs heat, it becomes what's called more stratified. Warm surface water is less dense and doesn't mix with cooler water below. When the ocean absorbs oxygen, it stays near the top, starving marine life residing in the lower levels. The water under the warm surface is known as the ocean interior. So that has all these downstream consequences to the biodiversity in the interior of the ocean um, and their ability to respire um, and to maintain the ecosystems on the seafloor. This oceanic transformation has profound consequences, not only in the water, but also on land for those who rely on it for their livelihood. My biggest fear is that tomorrow I'll go out and there's no more lobsters. Phoenix, Arizona. This sweltering southwestern metropolis is dealing with an imminent climate threat. Researchers are mapping out how extreme heat could lead to a rippling collapse in infrastructure, warning that Phoenix could be the canary in the coal mine that will demonstrate how ill-equipped we are for a future of mutant heat. If we were to lose power here during a particularly hot week in the summer, I think, unfortunately, we'd be looking at uh, mortality statistics in the many hundreds, thousands, or even worse. Each summer already brings upwards of 200 cases of heat-related death in our community, and that's with air conditioning provided to well over 90% of the homes in our city. Millions around the world rely on air conditioning as an ally to battle the effects of a warming planet, but it's adding to the problem. When air conditioning is used, again, on a massive scale in cities, what the air conditioning is doing is it's basically taking the hot air from inside and pushing it outside. So it can already take a heat wave where if it weren't for all the air conditioning use, maybe it would be 30 degrees outside. But now with all the air conditioners are pushing the heat out, it raises the air temperature to 31, 32 or whatever in the downtown core. And California, we started to see it over the last couple of summers where temperatures get so hot over such a large area where the utility company has to start limiting the amount of power it gives. In Europe, it gets so hot that railway lines buckle and you have to stop all the trains running because they just can't travel along the, the steel anymore. They're, they're bending because they're essentially becoming too hot and they're becoming fluid. Oh. Um, people's cars are more likely to overheat. Get in the Airplanes can't take off and land because you don't get the same lift over the wings with higher air temperatures, so you have to ground all the airplanes. Where's the best place to be here? In the summer of 2019, France suffers heat waves lasting 18 days with record-breaking temperatures of nearly 115 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat waves cause fires across the south, leaving 1,500 people dead. In Yemen, soaring temperatures are compounded by blackouts as their fragile electrical grid falters under the demand. Things basically stop working. People are reliant on that infrastructure to keep them cool, to have water, and that's why we're seeing in some of these places tens of thousands of deaths at times in these heat waves.
July 2018, Montreal, Canada. The city is struggling through a deadly heat wave. With the humidity, the city is feeling like 104 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest temperature for decades. Summers were great when I was a kid, especially in a Nordic country like Canada. Summer comes along and you're quite happy to have it. Most of my friends had pools in their backyards, but it wasn't a big rush to go to the pool. It was something that was just a normal summer activity, not necessarily to get out of the heat. What I recall is uh, regular temperatures, uh, clean blue skies, uh, not a lot of rain, not too much sun, uh, never hearing about be careful, drink enough. Uh, you know, we would just go out and have fun. As a changing climate intensifies extreme heat events around the world, one of the planet's most precious commodities is disappearing. Humanity is facing a global water crisis. This depletion of water supply is threatening every aspect of our planet, including the water we drink and the food we eat. And the issue spans both developing and developed countries. In Arizona, we're currently in a drought that's spanning over two decades now. Our temperatures are so much warmer now. So if you think you have warmer temperatures, well, that evaporates more water. That bakes the soil out quicker. So your droughts go on longer and become more intense. The way we use water in the Southwest United States is becoming more important. There's more people moving here. And because the climate is getting warmer, it's evaporating more of our water. And so we have to deal with using less water in the future The Colorado River, which provides water to one in eight Americans, is experiencing the worst drought in recent history. Over the past 20 years, the flow of water has been steadily diminishing. Regions dependent on it could face a water rationing crisis, as California did during its seven-year drought beginning in 2011. Many of the farms between Phoenix and Tucson were abandoned about 15 to 20 years ago when we started to go into this decadal drought. And it's, this is only becoming worse and more farmland is becoming abandoned. And we suspect that that trend is going to continue in the foreseeable future. Mutant heat waves continue to ravage the globe. Yeah, fueron largos, casi ocho meses de, de sequía sin, sin lluvia. Y el pasto totalmente se, se secó. In January 2019, Australia suffers through temperatures well above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. G'day, everybody. We had so far 194 flying foxes that passed away due to the extreme heat yesterday. Conditions are so extreme that Australian authorities euthanize livestock who would otherwise die of thirst. On the other side of the globe, Parts of the Middle East sears, reaching a deadly high of 129 degrees Fahrenheit. And in India, 184 people are left dead after the country endures one of its longest heat waves on record, with temperatures hitting 123 degrees. I think that a lot of what climate change is, certainly in the near future, is going to disproportionately affect the poor in our society. Yeah, I have a nice house, I have air conditioning in it. If it gets hot, I turn on the AC. Um, you know, if I'm living below the poverty line, maybe I don't have a nice house, maybe I don't have AC, maybe my power has been cut off because I haven't paid the bill. So this is, this is something that does concern me and I think it's something that is gonna put more and more burden on these poor people in our society that can't cope. Warming doesn't affect every place the same way. More than 80% of the U.S. population and more than 50% of the world population live in urban environments. Urban environments create and absorb heat differently than rural areas. Phoenix, Arizona is a stark illustration of how the city's configuration contributes to warming. 
When we're talking about climate change, we really need to be thinking about two big parts to the story, not only global emissions, but also urban heat, how much warmer our cities are because of the way they've been designed and the types of machines that we operate there. This urban heat phenomenon is known as the urban heat island effect, where solar heat and hot air from both buildings, air conditioning and heating systems, as well as vehicles, gets trapped between densely built high rises. A city with one million people can be almost two to five degrees Fahrenheit hotter than its surrounding rural areas. Urban heat has been the dominant driver of warming in cities like Phoenix for the past several decades. Our best estimates are that urban heat contributes to about one third of the heat related deaths in our region. On a sunny day in the urban heat environment, the pavement's surface can be 90 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the air. Not good news for a city like Montreal. We have a number of parks that have a lot of concrete in it. So the typical like downtown-ish area, residential areas lacking uh, green spaces, lacking water uh, spots. So um, those areas in Montreal are notably higher uh, temperatures than other areas. The city is uh, well aware of that. Every year we have notices of uh, what the heat spots are. Montreal and Phoenix may seem like polar opposites, but both need to figure out how to solve the problem of the urban heat effect. Phoenix is home to almost two million people and is seeing robust development throughout the area. But current building techniques make the city vulnerable to the urban heat island effect. We need to be looking at our surfaces, what color they are and what types of materials that we're using. We can choose materials that are better at reflecting heat away from our city or at least ensuring that it's not absorbed into the ground and more slowly released at night. In a desert climate, a very attractive style is a low building that's earth colored with small windows and strategic use of shading. Newer construction, you can see a drift away from some of those core architectural principles about how to effectively live and design for a desert climate. Uh, this is not only providing fewer opportunities for people to seek relief, but in some ways is making the problem worse in that we're not finding ways to keep heat off of surfaces and keep heat off of the people who are walking in and out of these buildings. Stonington, Maine. On the east coast of the United States, warming oceans are threatening the livelihood of lobster fishers. Stonington really is extremely dependent on the lobster industry, probably, to be honest, to a point that is slightly concerning, because when the bottom drops out, if the bottom drops out, we're going to be in a very vulnerable position economically. Lobster fishers adapt by chasing the lobsters that have moved to colder, deeper water, but it comes at a price. Bigger boats, bigger gear, longer days, higher expenses, bigger crews, then if there is a decline, you're heavily invested financially. We have created this thing called the Gilded Trap, where we're socioeconomically, culturally, so dependent on lobster. But Stonington's loss is Nova Scotia's gain. Located about 100 miles east, the waters around this Canadian maritime province is the new cooler home for Maine's lobsters. We've seen that resource shift up into Canadian waters and out of the Gulf of Maine. That fishery was closed, and I don't expect that we're going to see it come back. Canadian lobster fishers are experiencing their own boom now, but they too are not immune to rapidly warming ocean waters and fear they will suffer the same fate as Stonington, with declining stocks leaving them with an uncertain future. As overall oceanic temperatures continue to rise, a mutant marine phenomenon emerges, the blob. The blob is an ocean heat wave, a massive patch of abnormally warm water. Blobs are an evolving field of science. Researchers are trying to solve how these aggressive ocean heat waves are born and their link to climate change. 2013, researchers detect an area with unusually high temperatures in the North Pacific. In three years, it reaches a peak size of about 1.7 million square miles, eventually settling into three patches off the west coast of the United States and Canada. Rising temperatures already disrupt oceanic life, but the aggressive heat of the blob unleashes a wrath that destroys ecosystems, species, and threatens those who depend on fishing for a living. 2019, 
A blob-like heat wave is back. It covers 4 million square miles, over three times the size of Alaska. In some areas, the blob releases a plague of toxic algae, and scientists are worried this may amount to a massive die-off of marine life, similar to what happened during the last blob event. Blobs of various sizes are emerging all over the world with greater frequency. Coral reefs are very vulnerable to the blob. We lost up to 50% of our corals. Healthy coral gets its color and nutrients from the algae that lives in their tissues. In excessively warm waters, coral expels that algae. It's left bleached out and weakened. They're able to survive for a period of time, but it depends how long the temperatures stay high and how high they go. We're seeing these massive coral bleaching events. We're literally watching the extinction of the Great Barrier Reef happen in front of our face, where leading coral scientists in Australia are saying, within 10 years, it's gone. Scientists warn the coral reefs will dwindle by 70 to 90% if global temperatures rise by just 1.5 degrees Celsius. If warming hits 2 degrees, over 99% of the reef will die. Sometimes coral bleaching can be recovered from, sometimes not. That is a slow rolling disaster for the equatorial global ocean. And those environments will unravel in my lifetime and will not be the same. And the idea that those places will be removed from the, the, the surface of the, of the global ocean, that keeps me up at night, for sure. As ominous as the blob is to the future of the coral reefs, another menace threatens their existence, the absorption of carbon dioxide into the oceans. You could imagine like um, a pump from the gas station. We're pumping CO2 into the surface ocean, and that is changing the chemistry of the surface ocean. It's creating more acidic water, and that more acidic water changes the physiology and the ecology and the behavior of vast biomes of life. And that includes the coral reefs, where ocean acidification is the new grim reality. Some live coral can live in acidic waters. They have the ability to produce more calcium concentrate and rebuild their hard shells if acidity levels are very low. But now, the rate of ocean acidification is happening too quickly for the coral to regenerate what they've lost, leaving vast coral graveyards throughout ocean beds. Phoenix, Arizona. The sun beats down with punishing strength in the afternoons, but at night, temperatures have seen the most drastic spikes. People talk about how nights used to be cool and refreshing, and now they no longer are. People used to walk barefoot on the streets regularly in the summer months, and now they no longer do. People seem uh, quite aware of the fact that the weather has changed here considerably over their lifetime. Temperatures at night have been slowly increasing over the past couple of decades, uh, not only in Phoenix and other cities around the world as well. Ariane Madel researches ways to make cities livable in the face of rising temperatures. The impervious surfaces that we bring into the city in, term, in terms of roads, asphalt, parking lots, those store the heat, and then at night they slowly release it. Nighttime temperatures are increasing at double the rate of daytime highs in the United States. Lack of respite from sweltering environments is the central issue in heat-related conditions. The nighttime minimum is important because it tells you how much relief people actually get from the heat at night. So if it's hot all day and you go home and it doesn't really cool down at night, that poses additional heat stress on your body. That means that you have to run your air conditioning much longer at night and um, much stronger. Over time, as cities become more populated, bigger, uh, both vertically and horizontally, we see nighttime temperatures continuing to increase in a place like Phoenix that's been seven, eight, or nine degrees Fahrenheit since the middle of the last century. In the near future, nighttime temperatures in places like Arizona may only cool to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. But it's not just humans who suffer. Hotter nights reduce milk production in dairy cows and endanger rice and corn yields. July 2018, Montreal, Canada. 
At the old brewery mission, Vincent Osru is on the front lines of mutant heat, taking care of some of Montreal's most vulnerable citizens, the homeless. The room here behind me uh, was uh, full to the gills all week. Our normal attendance uh, would be just under 200 people. Uh, we were well over that for a whole week. Peak days, uh, we've had 1,000 people. All the tables were taken and people were standing up. People that were in for a few hours, we would ask them to um, have a half hour or uh, 45 minutes out outside to uh, let some people in. So we did have to have rotations even indoors for the air conditioning. It was so bad. Montreal winters regularly see extreme cold with temperatures falling below zero degrees Fahrenheit. But extreme heat is far from normal. When people think of the weather, they think a lot about the cold because the cold will hurt. That's the thing about the heat. People don't mind it. They disregard it. Um, heat doesn't sting, doesn't bite. It's a very sly problem. You'll feel a bit of dizziness. You'll feel that you're uncomfortable. When you're starting to feel dizzy, it's already too late. You're already dehydrated. In 2018, uh, we did have a few uh, people that had to be transported to the hospital. The heat wave had a, a huge impact on the citizens of Montreal. Approximately 90 people died. With climate change, we're going to keep seeing more frequent, intense, and in longer in duration heat events. Um, so it's, it's just going to get hotter and hotter, and especially more extreme heat. We can expect that there's going to be more and more people that are going to be at risk of health consequences during heat waves in the near future. And when we speak about near future, these are things that will happen by 2050. Continually rising temperatures are an ever-increasing danger for Vincent Osru and the people he cares for. Summer in Montreal is becoming more and more difficult. Um, way more difficult than it was 20 years ago when I moved in. Definitely uh, the climate as a whole and the heat as a specific um, is an, a new and added problem to an already difficult life. Um, people uh, that are living in a homeless situation already have a pretty complicated life, um, which is al also a problem in terms of dealing with the heat. And when you're homeless, um, life is just one great big difficulty. <laughs> the Gulf of Maine. These waters continue to heat up at a rate faster than 99% of the world's oceans. It's particularly susceptible to warming, partly due to how ocean currents react with each other. Ocean currents are like expansive rivers that sweep around the globe. Some flow a short distance, others circle all around the world. One of the globe's key ocean currents is the Gulf Stream that originates in the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf Stream is an ocean current that runs all the way along the east coast of the United States and then up along the east coast of Canada. And it transports warm water from the tropics all the way into the North Atlantic. It's part of a network of ocean currents that move heat from the equator to the poles and back. This circulation is important in controlling the climate. It has a huge bearing on temperatures across all of Europe. It basically keeps Europe from going back into an ice age. It affects climate patterns, weather patterns globally. And that is dependent upon uh, ocean temperatures being a certain, uh, within a certain range. In the Gulf of Maine, the northbound Gulf Stream skims against the southbound Labrador Current, which originates in the Arctic Ocean. Historically, the Labrador Current would flow into the Gulf, sinking under the warm waters of the Gulf Stream to keep the Gulf of Maine cool and its marine ecosystem balanced. But melting in the Arctic is changing that. One of the biggest concerns is something called Arctic amplification, and that's the fact that the, the, the high polar regions, particularly the northern hemisphere polar regions, are warming much faster. As Greenland melts faster and faster and dumps increasingly large amounts of fresh water into the ocean, uh, it's, it's, it's disrupting that current. Fresh water isn't as dense as salt water, so it doesn't sink as easily and can't circulate through the deeper ocean interior. This slows down the currents and the movement of the heat becomes lethargic. 
So every ocean scientist that I know is trying to unpack and reveal discrete, different stories of how this phenomenon is unraveling in the surface ocean around us, changes that are happening in the ocean at, at, at this very moment. Changes like the ones occurring in Stonington. The warming water has brought us more lobster, but the waters will continue to warm and therefore potentially threaten the lobster population. The only thing that may save us is if other fisheries move into our waters and we are able to access them. The age of mutant heat is here. Temperature records are routinely shattered by oceanic and atmospheric heat that is continually increasing, transforming every part of the globe. The planet is on track to warm 3.2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, which will create a world that is unrecognizable. Our cities, our agriculture, our transportation, and the habitats of every living thing on the planet are at risk. It's really, really, really bad. The impacts that are coming with climate change are, are vast and massive. Often I walk through the world and it's like I'm behind the looking glass because the rest of the world is operating like it's still the 20th century, that greenhouse gases don't warm the atmosphere, that we aren't like rocketing towards a completely new and different planet. When people talk about, oh, we still have 10 years to avert the catastrophe, this is nonsense. We're in it right now. We are going to move into a non-analog future where the ocean will not look chemically, physically, biologically like the ocean of my childhood or the ocean of the beginning of the 20th century. Heat waves are going to be more frequent. They're going to be more intense. And when they happen, they're going to last for a longer length of time. The duration is going to be longer. The threats posed by mutant heat have become clearer. And with clarity, they have become even more terrifying. The World Health Organization predicts there will be 38,000 more heat-related deaths each year between 2030 and 2050. Continued warming of global waters will enlarge dead zones in all our oceans. Marine animals are predicted to decrease by 15%, and catches by fisheries could decline by almost 25% by the end of the century. On land, fatally high temperatures will be the new normal in many areas. Many large cities will become uninhabitable. Climate change could lead to severe drought across 40% of all land on the planet, double the amount today. And a warmer world creates conditions for deadly mutant weather of all kinds. Hurricanes, wildfires, and floods will become more powerful and deadly, disrupting our civilization. Those on the front lines grapple with an uncertain future that threatens their livelihoods and lives. Every day you go out, there's something. Getting caught in your ropes or a weather problem, rough seas or something like that, you're always kind of taking a gamble every day you leave. But I would say there's reason to be fearful. Personally, I feel that not believing in climate change is like not believing in the moon landing, and it's a conspiracy theory. I believe in climate change. I believe in science. I support research. I think it's real. I personally <laughs> definitely have major concerns for the future. I, I do not fear it will be worse. I know it's going to be worse, to the point where we wonder why we're making kids. And it's a parent of six that is saying that. Once we hit 2 and 3 and 4C warming, which is essentially already baked into the system by a lot of people's estimations, then what happens in India where we see a, a, a several fold increase in heat waves? You have a lot of people around the world who are going to be dislocated in the millions in areas that are flooding or it's drought and they simply cannot live there. There will be significant more strain on infrastructure in terms of water resources, um, infrastructure in terms of, uh, you know, communication networks, rail networks, airline networks. Agriculture at the scale that it's happening and where it's happening uh, fails in a matter of single digit years. And we have mass starvation uh, in single digit years and failure of governments to control anything and total breakdown and it, it, it starts to become hard to envision that humans make it through that.